for Shakespeare, life is a theater. And that is more true for academic conferences and conference on Europe and power. You are agree? The concepts of power, of war, of empire are so dramatic. Theater fits them so much, so much as now. The purpose of this presentation is to talk about the relationship between empire and asymmetric warfare. My presentation will be in two parts. First, I will try to show the link between asymmetric warfare and empire through the definition of asymmetry in asymmetrical warfare. We will see that during the Cold War, the theory of asymmetric warfare was linked with a theory of imperialism. In second part, within a political philosophy and scientist perspective, I will try to define asymmetric or imperial warfare as synergetic, a form of manhunt and the consequences of this approach in considering the relation between war and state, or empire and power. The link between asymmetric warfare and imperial warfare is easy to demonstrate if once we define what we mean by asymmetry. Speaking of revolutionary warfare in 1963, the French military officer David Galula presents asymmetric warfare in terms of the asymmetry between insurgents and counter-insurgents. As Galula states in his time, it is the same war for both camps in terms of space and time. Yet, there are two distinct warfares, the revolutionary and, uh, shall we say, the counter-revolutionary. In this way, he supposes an asymmetry between these insurgents and the counter insurgents The model of revolutionary warfare had already been given by Mao Zedong. But if Mao describes the laws of insurgency as a protracted struggle, Galula asks, what then are the rules of counter-revolutionary warfare? Thus, Galula suppose, propose, propose was to define these rules of counter-revolutionary warfare or counter insurgency We can observe that all war is double, with an attacker and a defender. The attacker goes into the defender territory, and this territory becomes a theater of war or operation. Yes, a theater again. Because uh, the defender can sooner or later strike back or bring war to the attacker territory, we could understand a form of equivalency between attack and defense a sort of symmetry. But in the revolutionary or asymmetric warfare, as Galula shows for insurgency and counter insurgency, the theater of war is the same. The stake of this war is not just to attack, invade or defend a territory, but on one hand to maintain or enforce political power, and on the other, to seize such power. Because power is the state of revolutionary or asymmetric warfare, we could understand two things. One, the ways to sustain or undermine power are not the same as, for example, a counter-insurgent. A counter-insurgent should be not uh, using uh, terrorism, I say uh, should be. And two, if in this kind of war, more than other war, 
The distinction between soldiers and civilians is delicate. It is because the population is in the center of the conflict. Cards want to help sustain or undermine the political power in place. However, if Galula appears to be right in showing the asymmetry between insurgency and counter insurgency, he seems to forget an important element of revolutionary warfare, the problem of imperialism. Speaking in 1973, just a decade after, another French military figure, General André Beaufre, admits that colonial war constitutes the ideal, ideal domain for revolutionary war. Following Beaufre's arguments, we could say that colonial war is the matrix, the original form of revolutionary or asymmetric war. In, this, in the same way, the Peace Research founder Johann Galtung, speaking in 1968 of the opposition between peace and violence, peace is for him, as an hypothesis, a form, an absence, uh, no, no, an absence of violence. But this violence, constraints or acts of coercion, is for Galtung double. He distinguish direct and personal violence from indirect or structural violence. Warfare with the use of weapons is a kind of direct or personal violence. But about indirect violence, Gatun says that the general formula behind structural violence is inequality above all in distribution of power. Thus, Gaitung introduced the link between asymmetry and inequality of structural violence. Gaitung also affirms that this kind of violence should exhibit a certain stability. Three years later, in 1971, Galtung develops the line, this line of analysis to propose a structural theory of imperialism. In short, Galtung talks about imperialism as one of the major forms of structural violence, with asymmetry dividing the world between center and periphery nations and giving to each nation, nation its centers and periphery. So, the asymmetry of asymmetric warfare can be understood as a structural inequality between powers, between nations or within nations. In short, civilization, as far as, is a kind of barbarism. From this perspective on violence, we could understand that in all warfare, is a kind of personal violence linked to a political agenda. Revolutionary and colonial warfare are specifically asymmetric due to an inequal distribution of power. This power can be economic, military, or political. But Galton's perspective is not about military conflict, but about peace and as an absence of violence and social injustice. The author that makes the link between Galtung view and military thinking is the British political scientist Andrew Mack, with his famous article Why Big Nations Lose Small Wars, The Politics of Asymmetric Conflicts. Published in 1975, the article posits the link between the problem of asymmetric conflict and the history of imperial expansion. In the same year, year he writes another paper entitled Counterinsurgency in the Third World Theory and Practice, a title very similar to that Kalula book. 
However, he makes no mention of Galuda. There is a two article have the same background, the succession of the USA in the role of an imperial power, taking over from European powers. Mike Lind, like Galtung, defines the asymmetry as a structural relation because it is an asymmetry of resources. The intelligence can pose no direct threat, threat or the, to the survival of the external power because, already noted, they lack of invasion capability. On the other hand, the metropolitan power poses not simply the threat of invasion but also the reality of occupation. Asymmetric warfare is asymmetric and imperial because it is one-way relation. One power can invade and occupy a territory and not the other. It may uh, seem uh, Mac talking about uh, third world and it, is, uh, may, it may seem harsh to, and cynic to speak of a third world war or a war on the third world but I think this term is uh, this is uh, real appropriate, is appropriate in view of the violence that maintains the asymmetry of power in a cruel stability. And I can just say, la siate ogni esperanza. Peace. Now I would like to propose a rocking hypothesis on the thesis for political philosophy in today's reality. How do we characterize an empire and the asymmetric warfare of empire? To answer that question, I take the idea of the French philosopher Grégoire Chamaillou, best known for his uh, theory of rule. In this book, he talks about synergetic warfare to define today warfare. And synergetic warfare is a form of manhunt. But he defined uh, more largely um, in a previous book, Man Hunts, uh, what he, he uh, wants to see, to say, for uh, synergetic warfare and say that for all uh, colonial war and civil war. This uh, definition of uh, warfare is in five points. It says, this war takes not the form of a fight, but of a hunt. The balance of power is marked by a radical asymmetry of weapons. A structure that is not that of a duel, a third term as a dog, is uh, mobilized to mediate. For we don't recognize the enemy as an enemy, but an equal, but as a prey. We use non number means, including police or hunting tactics, rather than classic military means. Because the difference of uh, military power is so substantial, we don't fight the enemy, we hunt him. And in response, he prefers to avoid the classic military engagement and hunt back with terrorism and guerrilla warfare. But the hypothesis of Chamayou goes even further. If he thinks of asymmetric warfare as a manhunt, he also redefines the logic of this manhunt. While Hegel defines war and political and theory through the prism of his two famous master-slave dialectic, Chamayou proposed a dialectic of the hunter and the Dialectic. Sorry, of a proposed dialectic of the dialectic of the hunter and the hunted, because not only does the master hold the glory above the value of human life, but just capture the sleep. It's a, it's just a, that. Uh, as Frederick Engels uh, says for Karl Marx, uh, 
put the Hegelian dialectic on the, this on his feet, Shamayu proposed is in the same way. And uh, if Hegel's uh, master state dialectic was adequate for conceptualizing war and state for power, the interpreted model proposed by Shamayu extends the argument to address the empire and its endurance. Okay, next. My paper is a consideration of the transnational corporation as an empire, as an approach to understanding the dominance of transnational corporations. Uh, unlike Hobsbawm's Age of Empire, wherein imperial domination was affected through the colonization of territories via military might, the domination of these corporations is putatively economic, affected within and through market capitalism. And these corporations are supranational, but their existence, I argue, does not imply that states are defunct, nor that the legacy of the empires that rise to them is now irrelevant. Rather, I'm trying to I try to highlight the importance of acknowledging a global network of heterogeneous powers that can't be sufficiently explained away with a Westphalian model of state sovereignty or any world system theory which has the nation state as its basic unit. And so for my primary case, I'll be considering Amazon, which has warmed its way into almost every aspect of my life and the life of my colleagues, friends, family. And I try to avoid Amazon, which is a disclaimer that many of my friends also append to their confessions, that they can't avoid it. But I do have to admit that I use Amazon even when ordering books that are critical or antithetical to the idea of a dominant corporation like Amazon. And maybe this reveals as much about my socioeconomic background as about Amazon, but like whether it's Amazon Prime, e-commerce, Kindle, ordering books, or even Whole Foods, it really feels like uh, it's ubiquitous and really impossible to avoid. And this isn't what my argument is based on, but this sort of lived experience was definitely the unscientific impetus behind my interest in Amazon and its style of domination, which I will attempt to demonstrate is imperial. So the empire has historically been the domain of politics in whatever form across time and space. Um, Wallerstein describes the empire as a political unit and a mechanism for coll collecting tribute, and Doyle defines empire as a relationship, formal or informal, in which one state controls the political sovereignty of another political society. And of course, empire is also used colloquially just to, to refer to like a large commercial enterprise, like the empire of Samsung, which is a frequently used term. But I want to go beyond this sort of figurative use of the word because it's just an analogy and try to demonstrate uh, that it's, it, there's more to it than that. And uh, beyond, beyond this, there's also a substantial historical connection between capitalism and empire or imperialism. Um, Wallerstein writes that the establishments of the British and Dutch East Indian companies at the start of the 17th century was effectively the official birth of global capitalism. Um, and although they differ in degree, uh, various theorists, theorists from Lenin to Amin and beyond have put forth some sort of argument that equates a particular stage of capitalism to imperialism. Um, and Centeno and Cohen write that there's at least a historical coincidence between the rise of global capitalism and the expansion of Europe to global domination. And many theorists argue that these historical roots have led to capitalism in its present day imperialist form. Amin argues, echoing Lenin, that this historical legacy is manifested today as a new stage of imperialism in the form of a contemporary capitalism of generalized monopolies that dominate the world economy. Imperialism is the highest stage of capitalism operating on a world scale, and neoliberal globalization is the highest stage of imperialism that has penetrated every corner of the world, writes Ferber Wu, okay, arguing that both originate in the monopoly capitalism of the 20th century. 
and he specifically names the transnational corporation as the dominant institution that has facilitated global capitalist expansion. But the emphases on capitalism notwithstanding, these sort of approaches or diagnoses, including the very idea of monopoly and privatization themselves, nonetheless presume a cr crucial role for the nation state in such developments. And this is an implication that other theorists make more explicit. Um, some see the triad of the US and Western Central Europe and Japan as sort of the metropole or core of imperial capitalism. Um, others write of the imperial role that the US has played um, uh, via international institutions such as the IMF, for example. Um, and Kumbamu talks about the informal, the era of informal US empire. Um, this isn't a direction that I'm going to pursue at the present moment. Um, like, I do think that transnational corporations are significant actors and often act through organizations uh, for supranational governance. But because I think that approaching it from this perspective too still has sort of the nation state as the basic unit of analysis, I'm not going to go in that direction for the moment, uh, no matter how assistive or obstructive national or international commercial law is for the activities of transnational corporations. Uh, within a legal framework, we're always privileging sort of the influence of uh, the power and legitimacy of law, which comes from like organizations for governance, whether national or supranational. Um, and other ne neoliberal theorists distance the imperialism of today from the imperialism of the late 19th century by downplaying the importance of territories, but maintaining con continuity in their emphasis on the power of the territorial state, whether it's the US or the quote unquote West. And these theorists privilege the coercive tactics of economic imperatives as opposed to direct colonial rule as the key strategies of imperialist agendas today, but otherwise present the imperial capitalism of the 21st century in many ways as another iteration of British or French or imperialism in its ties to the nation state, whether they emphasize continuity or renewal. But I would argue that their characterization of a US-led imperial order is limited, particularly when addressing what seems to be a key element in both classical imperialism and the nation state, state violence via the military. Um, what many of these theorists, I felt, failed to do justice to in their emphasis on how states such as the US use coercive economic or political tactics is the underlying violence or threat of violence, like physical military violence that adds heft to the coercion of a state. And so this, I feel, renders their usage of the term empire somewhat metaphorical, at least if we try to think thoroughly about these uh, historical precedents as models for empire. And I feel like they blur the definitions uh, of imperialism and neoliberalism. Um, and, but, but I also feel like in, in some ways, many of these theorists are implicitly or explicitly writing against the concept of a supranational empire with the capital E introduced in Hart and Negri's empire, um, who argue that the the, the political implications of their idea that national divisions are disintegrating and that the world market tends to deconstruct the boundaries of the nation state and that the nation state is no longer a key actor. Hart and Negri have been accused of celebrating capitalism or of glorifying the so-called postmodern fluidity and hybridity of contemporary capitalism. And the repeated emphasis on the paradigm shift does run the risk of disregarding the legacy of empires, which are nowhere near as post as the term post-colonial might suggest. But their argument that empire introduces new hierarchies and networks of power, and that there has been a, a huge shift, and that current geographical divisions are no longer sufficient, I felt that that held much promise, especially in the concurrent shifts in the nature of state violence and their theorization of war under empire. Um, but rather than uh, taking their call to look beyond the nation state as an invitation to disregard the role of the nation state entirely or to like abstractify sort of the concrete conditions of labor and actual like geographical locations, I wanted to focus on rethinking the role of other non-state actors and how they interacted with nation states and how non-state actors interacted across borders rather than one subsuming the other. And I want to examine 
Amazon through the frame of empire. And this frame is in basic agreement with Hart and Negri's claim that there has been a sort of shift or rupture in contemporary capitalist production and global relations of power without necessarily subscribing to the new world order of capital, capitalized empire that they describe. And <laughs> um, right, so, so I'm, I don't have a complete theory, but um, I'm going to move straight on to Amazon. So the, the idea is to identify potential patterns or trends. And um, oh, I'll start with Amazon. Amazon is a retailer, marketing platform, delivery and logistics network, a payment service, a credit lender, an auction house, major book publisher, producer of television and films, fashion designer, hardware manufacturer, and a leader host of cloud server space. And in its role as an e-commerce titan, it's also created an ecosystem of businesses that depend on its infrastructure, and that, that's what makes it the part of what makes it do, so dominant. And of course, it superficially behaves like a predator, a dominator. Uh, but really, the impulse to theorize about Amazon as an empire, specifically as opposed to simply acknowledging that it's big and dominant in the global economy, uh, has its origins in several different aspects of Amazon, which I felt uh, res have resonance with empire as something that completely envelopes us and like, controls various aspects of our lives. First is that Amazon is supranational, supranational in the simplest sense, uh, in its international consumer base and its vendor base. Amazon Prime has more than 100 million subscribers worldwide, and 64% of U.S. households have Prime subscriptions. And according to a recent poll, 92% of Americans who shop online have purchased from Amazon. So in the sense that it's a monopoly, it fits the narrative of imperialism as monopoly capitalism. Um, and second, while the state is defunct, the fact that Amazon's fortune is being funneled into space travel and exploration company of its owner, Jeff Bezos, alerts us to the possibility that the traditional roles of the state are surely being challenged. And privatization implies sort of state initiative. This is, I feel, a different scenario. Um, and in the same vein, the madness surrounding the competition uh, named Amazon HQ2 among US cities to become the location of Amazon's second headquarters, it's reminiscent of the seemingly less competitive Olympics post city bids. Um, and HQ2 is clearly not Amazon versus nation state, but if any of these cities' bids should become accepted, it's at least been raised as a possibility that a city in Georgia might be renamed Amazon, with Jeff, as the per uh, Jeff Bezos as the permanent mayor. And in Boston, Amazon would get a team of public servants dedicated to lobbying for Amazon to the Bostonian government, while in Austin, Amazon could become the quote-unquote social fabric and future of the city. And third, Amazon, not just Amazon itself, but its owner and Silicon Valley, from which it is separate, but also associated with, creates a certain kind of culture and produces certain kinds of self-legitimating knowledges. Neither imperialism nor colonialism is a simple act of accumulation and acquisition, right side, who talks about the impressive ideological formations um, that include notions that certain territories and people require and beseech domination. Many of the knowledges produced by Amazon draw on larger myths and ideals of Silicon Valley capitalism. Silicon Valley might be the so-called metropole, and it's characterized by a self-conscious altruism built on a belief in exceptionalism. And this pattern of beliefs, behaviors, and narratives that circulate among the tech elite of Silicon Valley has echoes of an aristocratic noblesse oblige tinged with a quasi-enlightenment belief in the potential of humanity. Um, and Amazon doesn't wholly sus subscribe to these ideologies. But neither has Amazon, despite its reputation issues, labor issues, and noted lack of philanthropy, as criticized by various US politicians, has been truly damaged by it. And it's, is it because, as Wood writes, exploitation under capitalism is opaque, because on the face of it, capitalists and labor are equal, and Amazon's workers are also Amazon's consumers? And do self-reinforcing ideas about the necessity of Amazon play a role at all? Um, according to the report on the survey of Amazon users, the main draw online shop, the shopper site for Amazon is two-day shipping. And as the report notes, though most retailers now offer this perk, people continue to associate with Amazon, which has all but willed this cultural change into existence. Um, 
And a key characteristic of this Silicon Valley culture, which has become archetypal to the point that it's parodied in various TV and film representations, is a certain pretense of anti-bureaucracy and anti-hierarchy that obscures real material power imbalances. But however the corporation chooses to represent its values, like the citizenship of an empire or the nation state, corporations have memberships. And the bureaucracy of a corporation, like Amazon, is accompanied by its own set of forms, surveys, and it administers to its own populations. And in a sense, the data collected by a corporation from its members on individuals and entire populations, it outweighs government census data, if not in comprehensiveness, then in depth. And it reveals more about the individual than merely their gender, age group, ethnic group, or social economic status. It covers tastes and preferences and habits. And while disregarding geographic specificity or believing in total deterritorialization is unimportant, it, it is not the right move. Corporations buy land too. At the same time, in many instances, physical territory has become a less important indication of power and far from being the only measure of imperial domination. In organizational theory, the role of a form or document within an organization is to enable coordination and uh, <laughs> control by providing the prototypes of acceptable and expected actions in the organizational setting. And in their study of incident record forms in police bureaus, uh, Cameo and Whalen demonstrate how the form acts as a medium for reifying a certain kind of membership categorization, institutionally recreating the person stripped of its local historicity and transforming a certain way of describing persons into seemingly transparent social facts. And I go on to talk about how in the case of a corporation of Amazon, the relevance is not how in just its forms, but the data, not just in the data, but the forms create a particular type of personhood, uh, that of a consumer, a bundle of desires. Um, and time is up, so we'll take Great. Thank you. Hey. This is a geek moment. Uh, again, uh, geekiness uh, personified. Uh, we've got uh, a lot to cover, so I'm going to move pretty quickly. Just to prove to you that geeks can contribute to some extent uh, in this uh, very, very rich discussion of political theory. Um, Three years ago, I submitted a paper to uh, this conference on uh, uh, fake news, basically, online uh, political uh, uh, manipulation and trickery and all that. And I was greeted warmly, got some uh, good response for the paper. That's this conference. A lot of you attended that. Uh, and so I guess fake news is still in the news, isn't it? I guess some of the concepts that I was uh, working on way back when, which were seemed, uh, you know, it seemed rather odd to be talking about, are indeed. Uh, important today. And a little bit about my background in terms of artificial intelligence, because a lot of you have associated me with that because of that uh, uh, presentation and a few other things I've written. Uh, AI has a lot to do with the issues that we're going to be talking about. Uh, why, why would it be? Because, of course, uh, we cannot be sending astronauts into uh, all of these areas, we need to have some type of uh, intelligent manipulations, and AI has been associated with these for a long time. This just came out, and if you'd like a copy, I still have legal copies to give out, uh, copyright uh, 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 appropriate copies and all of that before I do the illegal copies, okay? You can, you can get my drafts. Uh, but indeed, uh, this is uh, uh, reflecting uh, the Star Wars era, okay? As you can see, I'm a little long in the tooth. Uh, and I've been teaching uh, uh, artificial intelligence and AI uh, as well as IT issues for over 30 years. And so back in the 1980s, we were fighting something that a lot of you remember, Reagan's Star Wars, okay? We'll talk about the uh, uh, science fiction linkages to all of this, we'll get into some uh, uh, cartoons as well. Uh, but again, the, the Star Wars notion, uh, we can shoot of uh, uh, missiles out of the sky with intelligent pebbles, uh, the smart pebbles notion. I was writing on the smart pebbles notion whether or not that would be possible. A few missiles might get through, they might be nuclear. Well, that's a mistake, it's a bad Tuesday. You know, what, what can we say? But that's the type of thing that uh, people who have at least some background, some knowledge, some 
some uh, uh, acquaintance with this, which we can all get, which all of you have, indeed. Uh, uh, and, and you need to bring it to play, because, uh, of course, we're, we're entering all these issues. I love what uh, Russell was saying early on. We need to be talking about the internet. We need to be talking about the new technologies as we move along. So again, um, I was reflecting on that with my work with the computer for professionals for social responsibility. Study just out on artificial intelligence and war that people are becoming more attuned to these issues. Can we have AI as a part of war? And uh, it's not the only aspect of space, but indeed uh, uh, it's an aspect of interest. Uh, we still have a very divided nation as to whether or not that's appropriate um, uh, uh, material here that, that drills down a bit. Uh, what, 30% or something like that are saying it's appropriate, but if other people do it and other nations and other corporate systems uh, are involved in it, maybe we'd be uh, 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 thinking differently. Uh, let's put it that way. Okay, so what do we need, mean by outer, outer space? Lots of outer space issues in the news. What are we talking about? Uh, SpaceX? Uh, we're talking about, oh, over dinner, some of us were saying, is Musk out of his mind or not? Uh, uh, <laughs> Elon Musk. Uh, let's see, what are the, uh, the, the plans here? Uh, maybe in six years? Okay, we're, we'll be shooting up uh, 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 and, 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 uh, uh, missiles, and we'll be uh, setting up uh, uh, the, the uh, infrastructure for space uh, colonization of Mars. Uh, who's interested in... Uh, in uh, uh, the moon, uh, Bezos, we were talking about Amazon. We didn't coordinate, but we had some fun talking about these issues before the uh, um, conference started. But space is empire. Uh, let's move along. Of course, um, science fiction concepts, um, they're, they're e easily at hand. Again, the Star Trek, Star Wars notions and all of that, that we're going to be uh, seeing in the recent discussions on space is empire. And of course, uh, these issues provide uh, an amount of commercial and political concerns. You need, you need to have expertise. Okay, Bob uh, Rushlight, many of you uh, were talking about the engineering aspects, and of course uh, Wayne was talking about that as well. We'll, we'll uh, I hope at the end, uh, link back into some of these, um, not just in space, but in the biological aspects, the new uh, genetic engineering notions as well. Uh, and of course, spaces of fire rooted in the technological considerations and professional communities that I've been a part of for a long time. We collaborate. I collaborate with uh, people from Kuwait, not fond of the government over there, <coughs> collaborate. Uh, with people from Russia, not fond of what's going on, I collaborate. It's technical. We do this. That's what, uh, what it's about. And so I think some of that needs to be reflected in the political theory here. Uh, we're dealing with a new world. We're um, uh, coupling with immediate and practical con uh, concerns. I'm going to push on so I can get to the space junk thing, because I think that's the key. Space debris. You can weaponize space debris. Some of it, as we were talking about this morning, does uh, disintegrate, uh, and we, it's not an issue. But the weaponization of space debris, and I didn't bring up my, up my pool cue, pool cue uh, but you can actually weaponize space to, uh, debris to the point at which you won't have your fingerprints on it, and you can knock one of those satellites out of space, that thing that you're hiding. It's okay, you're, I know you have to check your email, uh, <laughs> or send text. Uh, we all do it. Uh, that will stop, okay? It'll stop. You won't be able to have your uh, Internet of Things work in your homes. Your 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 the heat will will uh, uh, stop. The water won't flow. Uh, you can't. You can have warfare. I mean, when you folks are talking about warfare and violence, I'm talking about real violence, which is turning off the heat in Madison, Wisconsin, which you can do by uh, disturbing satellites in space. That's violence. Okay. And of course, we have linkages to the law of the sea. These, these concepts, Gideon this morning, yeah, we're dealing right now with pirates. I'll, I'll show you a pirate coming up. So we've got to, we got to get moving. Uh, we're at that level, which is why history is so important. How do pirates operate? This, this, this uh, <laughs> conference, five or 10 years from now, will have papers on that with the brilliant grad students who are uh, just starting up now, uh, making those linkages. Of course, we still have some problems with law of the sea issues. This is from a couple of days ago. We've got a scallops war. Again, uh, French and uh, English uh, folks uh, trying to battle it out. Uh, but we've got 
other recent events. Okay, I started writing this paper, and it was kind of mundane, you know, and it was, you know what, but maybe in a few years, some of these issues will come to the surface. And as I was writing a couple of months ago, uh, 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 President Trump precipitated, let's say he brought to the surface so much of what's happening, okay. Uh, I, I'm involved with a little uh, project over at NASA, and I got to talk to, with, with a bunch of astronauts, ex astronauts, um, about what's happening, and there's so much military stuff in there. It's been there for so long. Uh, every branch of the military is involved. Maybe not so much the Coast Guard, although we'll talk about the Space Force as possibly being better as a Coast Guard. Uh, but again, we're, there's so much in, in, uh, uh, as, as, as a part of, of what we're thinking about in terms of the direction, directions for the future that's involved in space. And we have the Space Force de declarations. We've got cartoons, slurring, um, um, introduced us to the power of cartoons. So many cartoons. I could have done the whole presentation on cartoons. Uh, of, uh, is, this, is this what he's looking for in terms of the Space Force? Now, the actual mechanics of the Space Force, what would it do? It would organize, streamline, and maybe make some uh, uh, you know, uh, benefits for uh, the efforts that are out there, uh, but the the uh, rhetoric involved. Of course, we need to be dominant in space, uh, not recognizing fully that one of Trump's greatest competitors and somebody who he's got a, a, a steady uh, a Twitter uh, conflict with, Twitter-based conflict with, um, is, 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 just, is Jeff Bezos of Amazon, who of course is associated with the Washington Post and of course has uh, such tentacles and spaces, a number of the other great uh, individuals we'll be talking about too. So more cartoons, you can have this presentation, those of you who love the cartoons, uh, we're talking about, oh gosh, we ought to get involved in space, and here's China, Russia, yeah, it's, we, yeah, they've been out there for a little bit. Uh, and then, again, the, the, the interactions propelled by the need that we have as, as people who are involved in technology to collaborate uh, are, are intense. Now, others, the, uh, cartoons, a little bit sarcastic, we're sending Trump out to the space, okay. Uh, uh, not, not to be political, but this is part, we did have a positive cartoon, we have a negative cartoon about the uh, 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 five minutes, yeah, I can do this. Okay, so the focus of many analysts, uh, yeah, it's going to be a lot of money, okay? Huge money. We're talking of uh, uh, Morgan Stanley, conservative, a trillion dollars pumped into corporations, not just Amazon, of course. Uh, we've got uh, 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 Google into, uh, uh, let's, let's, let's leave the list off. It'll be too long for me to, uh, uh, to repeat. Um, a space guard or a space force, unfortunately, something with, uh, became uh, incompatible here. But the notion of like, modeling the space force after a Coast Guard uh, actually has some sorts of uh, resonance. Unfortunately, the, the, uh, the uh, graphic didn't come out. But we need to worry about what's happening in space. And to get to that uh, wonderful discussion of, uh, of uh, space junk, space debris that's, uh, that's, that's bubbling up in the literature, I'm going to be moving on. Uh, uh, president Trump's plans have been in the works for some time, and the president's powers are in qu uh, somewhat question. Uh, maybe he's going a little too far. France is trying to get into it. Here we go. Uh, and of course, space law is evolving. Uh, what type of space law? <clears throat> lots and lots of material in the, in the presentation. If you'd like to drill down on the slides, you can enjoy the picture of. Uh, uh, Trump portrayed as an astronaut. <coughs> but again, we have evolving space law, and we have the, the participants expanding. We have uh, China's role in space expanding with questionable motivations. Okay, the first identified rogue satellite uh, out in space. Uh, this comes from the company Swarm that went over to India and blasted off the, uh, um, the satellite that uh, was desired from India, had nothing to do with going through the proper channels, and this is the wave of the future. Again, we're in the 1600s, 1700s along these lines, give or take a century. Uh, we've got commercial concerns taking up increased military roles. We've got, of course, the SpaceX. Uh, we've got entertainment aspects. 
I love this stuff, okay? I live for this stuff. Uh, but uh, that, that could be happening. Now, oh, uh, uh, you, you, all, you all might have been hearing of what happened just uh, a little while ago. We're still uh, not exactly, uh, 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 you know, completely, uh, uh, let's say, elegant with our technologies. The space station, uh, you might have been traveling when this happened. Uh, a repair was made that was actually uh, done with the tip of the, the astronaut's finger and all that. Even though this is the Daily Mail, this is a real article. It was just the best, best description of, of what was going on. Um, the Daily Mail does have stories that are, are quite disconcerting along those lines. But just think of the International National Space Station. Uh, just think of the collaboration that's involved and, and the notion that we could have some sort of new type of, of uh, uh, sense of worldwide uh, uh, just, just closeness because of what's happening. Uh, maybe uh, still recognizing our various cultures, but uh, in, indeed uh, closeness. Oh, many nations involved are up there. Uh, Kids, uh, high schools are shooting uh, these, these small sats into space. Uh, let's get into the space truck, space debris. Millions of, of uh, centimeter sized particles, but what's really concerning, large space junk that can be weaponized, you can you get, uh, you know, intentionally, not so intentionally, uh, get an astronaut, uh, a, a particular satellite out of orbit, uh, or do some real damage uh, through uh, through uh, using space uh, debris in a way that is weaponized, that's that's a real concern. That gets us back into the pirate era. That gets us back into uh, trying to figure out who and what is the best way of handling all of this. Just some uh, statistics on the space debris. Who's got the sheriff? Now, again, using a Mac instead of my home computer, uh, who would make the best sheriff along these lines? Uh, there are ways to clean this up. There are some. Uh, ways to uh, actually uh, scoop. Uh, people are designing astronauts. I got uh, uh, satellites that scoop up some of the particles, and that might be a way of dealing with this. But you can see why we want those satellites to keep going. You want that phone to keep going. You want to be able to pump gas and, and use your GPS. Uh, uh, that's all satellite oriented. Until we harden, until we get to understand, that's about it. Yeah. Until we get a sense of the, the uh, let's say, the pre precariousness of a lot of the uh, instrumentality we're putting up there. We're going to uh, 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 indeed put ourselves into some interesting uh, ancient, ancient disputes uh, about who owns what, who has what, who has the right for passage and all of that. Uh, I, was, I was listing through that, listing uh, uh, a lot of the legislation, yes, the UN is involved, a lot of the organizations are involved that uh, I would, one, one would suspect have something to say with this. But one of the ways to reach us all is terms, in terms of standards, in terms of, 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 in, in, of in, in listing the professional communities that got us up there, okay? Amazing individuals who've spent their lives uh, with, with relatively small salaries, not a lot of recognition, but got us up here to, um, to, uh, uh, to space. So indeed, if you can, would like to, uh, uh, to take a look at my slides, I'd be happy to do so. I'll be writing this up, I hope, uh, and sharing this. Uh, but who holds what in outer space? Uh, there are, as we were, we were talking about, a wonderful nexus here. I hope that we'll be able to flesh it out during the Q&A of the, uh, the corporate issues that, uh, that are in sync with the political issues. Uh, nation states are still relevant, but to what point? And of course, uh, where we're at, <laughs> that, that, it's the end of the presentation anyway. Maybe that's my sign to, to move on. So uh, thank you very much, and uh, I hope, again, we can, we can uh, interact. Thank you. I think that anybody who shares the sort of garden variety critiques of neoliberalism has to welcome aspects of uh, Trump um, trade policy. I mean, that's precisely not neoliberalism. Uh, Trump is also an adamant critic of Amazon. Where do you position yourself in the uh, Bezos v. Trump uh, case? Huh? Uh, and the um, yeah on on Adorno and and Schmidt, yeah, I don't we don't we don't argue that they're the same. We say that there are, there are points of, of contact and points of similarity. Um, uh, and you claim that well Adorno's the advocate of the individual. I don't think so. I think the, uh, he, he's, he's very skeptical of the liberal individual. He dissolves that into the Gesamtgesellschaft all the time, which is a kind of aesthetic corollary to the total state. 
he doesn't have a theory of the total state because, like Marxists, he doesn't have a political theory. Um, the, uh, the, the, the precise question that I want to ask you as uh, an expert on this, and probably no one can ask this more easily. Um, so he, he, uh, he Schmidt, uh, has this admiration for Mussolini, and that's where the total state comes from, and, and Hitler, and, 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 and Mao Zedong. Does he have anything to say about Stalin? So can I just repeat the question back? You said uh, if um, you, you asked me where I position myself um, regarding Trump being an adamant criti uh, critic of Amazon, and like if if, if you how, how do you like, see Trump's critique of, of, of Amazon? Is it, is, it, is it the same critique you're making, or is it different? Um, I don't think Trump's critique of Amazon, like my critique of Amazon, is not so much. Um, like a critique of Amazon so much as uh, I, I think that like d regardless um, of whether like the state policy is neoliberal or not, I think Amazon or the transnational corporate as empire has like, it's grown to such an extent that it doesn't really matter. So Trump's uh, critique, I believe is more uh, tax centric that He's been dodging taxes by Seattle and funneling patents through. Yeah. But that, the, the specific policy law aspect of this. I, mean, I think. I mean. I guess the point is that if if I'll say we you know, want to be critical of Amazon and the, the economic regime that it represents, I think you got to recognize that uh, Trumpian populism is making that critique against Amazon. Yeah. yeah. Then sort of scrambles the political. No, it's all about fake news. Uh, <laughs> sure he's he's got the president of the United States, you know, the the United United States did not have monopoly power and, uh, and, and calling for its regulation. That's, uh, yeah, that's, that, I mean, that, that's pretty enormous. <laughs> yes, if you take yeah, what he says at face value and yeah, like think about it. Yeah. We're not European. And I'm not saying that just to be a persnickety historian, there's an important theoretical point. Uh, the first, for example, uh, globalization, merchant capitalist globalization in uh, Africa is in the 10th century with the spread of Islam across West Africa and, and then down along, down along the, the east coast of Africa uh, uh, with the, the, the Arab Empire. And we, we can go back further. We can talk about the Chinese uh, establishing their merchant capitalism throughout Asia. Uh, we can even go back further. I, I know Tunisia very well. The, the living history of Tunisia is a, is, is a, uh, um, a, a evocation of Carthage. Uh, so in the, in the Tunisian mentality, Carthage is part of their current outlook on the world. And Carthage was a, 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 also a merchant empire. So the Tunisians are not afraid of merchant capitalism. They, they, they've integrated it as part of their own identity, if you will. The second thing is, uh, even though Amazon is deterritorialized. It's like like a lot of uh, efforts that deterritorialize. There's a that provokes a re-territorialization. And you gave an example in your own in your own uh, presentation because now you're trying to avoid Amazon. You go to the local bookstore or you go to the local supermarket. The, so uh, there, there's there's a there's a provocation of a re-territorialization uh, uh, in uh, 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 or a creation of a kid, new new kinds of tribes, if you will. Uh, and for Sam. If, if Schmidt were to consider the United States not as a maritime power, but as a, both a continental power and a maritime power, because it is, it has been that, how would that change anything? And even if the United States is only a maritime power, uh, I would say this because, uh, of course, I've already mentioned to you that I know all about Vietnam, and my, my experience of Vietnam is from the Vietnamese point of view, because the American government forced me to learn Vietnamese to, to, to do my job. Um, the French lost the land war in Vietnam. So that's Schmittian. The Americans won. The Americans won precisely, uh, I think they won the war in Vietnam, for the social cultural reasons. Uh, because now Vietnam is Americanized, if you go there, to such an extent that now the foreign ministry of Vietnam calls me to come in and train their diplomats. Uh, I, I was the, the military loser, even there, there we can have a debate. So just on the social cultural dimension, you know, isn't this a problem for Schmidt? 
But yeah. since since I won't probably get a chance to answer any questions, yeah. I, I, you know, I have compulsive along these lines. We've got new territory. Mars. Okay. Okay. Mars. The moon. That's new territory. So in effect, I'm I'm answering what you're saying in the all. It, it, it's, it's a re-territorialization, even though it's it's new ter territory. Exactly. Need that same. Very, oh, very good. Oh, My question is about just the, the, the kind of political reach of, uh, of Amazon or Amazon uh, Corporation. And I guess it's a question of, well, you know, we have an example, I guess, of Google, uh, which has the same kind of reach as Amazon, except in China, right? Because China has basically prohibited Google from and Google services uh, from, from operating. So uh, I guess that, that indicates that, that you know as much kind of global reach as Google or Amazon can have, they run into a pretty hard wall when any particular sovereign government says, "No, we're going to exclude you uh, from our territory." So, uh, so I mean, I think in the past, you know, you know, we've got examples of from something like the, the British East India Company, where you've got a kind of collaboration between kind of military power and commercial power. That's able to open up sort of recalcitrant regimes, and you've got maybe the, the, the opening is an example of that. Uh, but unless you have that, then sort of the corporation itself is sort of interested in the face of that kind of uh, sovereign power. So that's, that's kind of a, a question about the limitations of right. so that kind of. Limited because they don't have like, their own military. Because they have no right. military, or they're, or they're not collaborating with a particular government that's going to kind of be the military arm of their. You know, corporate uh, aspect. And if Amazon, you know, we, 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 we've got to answer this. If Amazon provides cheaper services, satellite services, if Google provides cheaper, better satellite services, Weibo, whatever, will go to its store. That's that's the new mechanics of it. I mean, you're talking still, you know, that people on land can't get some things, but we're talking also about the, the reach of these these uh, corporations now. We're talking about space, so thanks. So, uh, and, and for Sam, 